Mix it with my boot camp tip, frequency masking. Frequency masking is a term that's used in a lot of artificial intelligence plugins, and it's used in a lot of demonstrations where people will tell you how to get you know, a kick drum and a bass to work together, and they'll often talk about it in the pure sense of just working with frequencies. And of course, there's a lot of value to that because different instruments will want to occupy similar frequency ranges. But if you purely and only approach this problem or these conflicts just through frequency, you'll often end up with less than desirable results in the end. And part of the reason is that most often you'll end up having to compromise one of the two sounds, if not both, in order to just get them to work together. But great mixes aren't about just making things work. They're about making things sound great. And so if you wanted to have a big bass sound and a big kick drum sound, it's possible, but you have to expand your palette of knowledge or the tools that you apply beyond just working with equalization. So again, I'm not trying to say like equalization is not the answer, but it's only part of it. The way that I look at, at the approach to a mix is I think of the mix is a 3D sound field, a dimensional sound field, meaning that there are height dynamics, some things that will raise, like you hear this often where a vocal lifts above the mix and the bass drops down below the mix or below the speakers. And so what you have is this height dynamic, and it's about creating contrast between the presence frequencies and the low end frequencies. And but that's a purely kind of two-dimensional kind of thing because you have pans left and right, you have volume, and then you have whatever frequency response patterns that you work in EQ in. And if you only work from that perspective, you end up with flat mixes. So even though you try to add reverb and do other things, if you don't create depth in the mix, then there's no place for that reverb to exist. So it just compounds the problem with all the frequencies. So the way that you work in depth dynamics is one by your level controls, right? So you can make something come more forward by raising the volume, move it back by lowering the volume. And also the primary uh, dynamic component for gain, which is compression. And compression will move things back and forth or take something that's dynamically moving and kind of contain the dynamic of it. So it maintains a tighter, closer position in the mix. Now, when you start to work with these and then start to put on effects and start to put on a whole thing, now all of a sudden you'll find that you can work with uh, a lot of other tools in order to create separation, giving you the ability to get a bit more of what you want. So what I have here is just a simple example here. I just have a kick drum and a bass. And so let's just have a listen to it. This is just raw, like no processing, um, nothing on it. Okay, so not the worst conflicting thing. You could still hear them separated. It's not a pile of mud. Okay, but just to give you an idea here of how this works, I'm just going to start here by just uh, throwing just a uh, Pro-Q3 here. Uh, I'm going to throw another one on here. This is a stereo track, but I'll just do it as a dual mono. So part of what I want to do is I want to sculpt the sound a little bit to bring out the aspects of the sound that I want. So if I have a kick drum, one thing to do here is to focus on the primary uh, weight of the kick drum. Right, so if I find that frequency, it's usually around 60 hertz. Right, I can focus in on a somewhat tight area and then take away the area that often will um, make uh, the kick drum sound a little bit woofy. It'll add some warmth to it, but it will create conflicts with other instruments like the bass in the mix. So I'll dip away a little bit of 200. This will help to tighten up the kick sound. Right, so now I have a little oomph there. I have a little clarity there. I can even tighten up the bottom there if I want to a little bit. Yeah, 
And if I want to make this a bit warmer sounding, all I have to do is just change the cue and widen it. Right? Or I could tighten up the cue and find some kind of balance. I often do this more than just adding more gain to the area. I just widen the area where I want it. And then I can maybe push in a little bit to the to the frequency that I want, you know, for the attack of the kick drum. I could even roll off a little bit off in the top if I like. All right, so now I have a little bit of oomph out of the kick that wasn't there to begin with. So you think that's going to cause more problems with the bass, right? Well, of course it will, but now we'll deal with the bass sound here. So let's work on this side of things. Right, I'm gonna pull in um pull in a, a good attack frequency here. All right, so driving into that, I probably need to bring down the gain a little bit here. So now I've added a little bit more oomph, created some separation, but now let's take it to another level. Now you've seen me do things here with, with uh, different vintage plugins. You could do this with kind of digital plugins. One of my favorite for working with something like, uh, you know, a, a kick drum is the API 2500. And there we go. And... Uh, this, let's just say that I want to kind of drive the kick drum. The next thing I want to do here with the compression, there's one of two ways that I can go with this. I can either make the kick drum kind of breathe so that really pulses and drives the mix, or make the bass breathe if I feel like the bass line is kind of driving the track a little bit more. So let me show you a little bit of both. So if I take the attack, let's go to a slow attack time, fast release time. Let's just get it to really drive a little bit. So I'm going to do two things here. So I have this with a slow attack and a fast release. And then I'm going to throw on something here. Uh, I like working with vintage components here. I'm just going to throw in an LA-2A. So what that's going to do is this is a broadcast limiter. It has about a millisecond attack time. And it has a longer release time. So it's going to be a little bit slower. There'll be some initial movement. But it's going to kind of hold on to the sound grab onto it a little bit and kind of keep the dynamic a little bit tamed down. So let's let's drop this and see what we got. Uh, drop the gain back here. So now what you get is the bass having stepping back a little bit 
kick drum kind of pulling forward a little bit, right? One other way to do it, and if I do it, like I could just do it very quickly here with just like a, a, a fair child, because you've seen me do something uh, similar here. And if I do the same over here, I can do something, let's just hear what it would be like the opposite. Uh, LA-2A, I don't, you know, I don't find they work quite as well. Oh, I did mono, that's okay. It's a uh, stereo track, so let me do this. Let me breathe, make the bass breathe. And then take the kick drum and then make that kind of stabilize a little bit. So now the bass feels a little bit in front of the kick drum, right? Right, so nice separation that features the bass, and then the alternative version is one that features the kick drum a little more. So whichever one you prefer, right? Let's just say that let's just say that we go with the um, let's just say we'll probably pick the opposite one, right? Uh, let's go with the one where I bring the bass out a little bit and kind of keep the kip, kit, uh, kick drum, excuse me, stabilized a little bit. All right, so let's move on to the next sort of thing here, without even getting into just you know saturation processing or anything, just like a simple effect thing. Um, just so uh, obviously this doesn't go on forever, but let me just put on here a couple of other things here, right? So I have one send here. I'm going to do two quick effect things here just to kind of show you how I can stage some things different. So now I got this bass here. Let's say I really want this bass. It's an important part and I really want to kind of drive it up front. So maybe I do something here where I, where I do like some kind of a, uh, let's see if I can spell little micro shift effect or something along those lines. So let's see. All right, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, to pull this forward, I'm just gonna drop a little imager in here. So that kind of lifts the bass out of the speakers. I'm not, I'm not going to mix it up that high, but let's hear. All right, so that'll pull it out forward. And then maybe what I'll do here on the other side is I'll do like a, a R verb. Just like a, maybe just like a bit of short room sound kind of thing. So let me just kind of go in a uh, room chamber. Maybe I'll go with like a nonlinear kind of thing here. Bring my size down. I'm going to do like a tight reverb pattern here. Maybe I will go with the room. Hold on, let me just go back over here. There we go, it's a little better. What is I'm gonna do here? All right, so I got a little space there. Now let me add a little reverb. Very tight space here. And let's see, I'm gonna mix that in. just to kind of give it a little ambient space, just a little bit of depth. Now let's see what happens here when we add the dimension. I'll just bypass the uh, sense. Here we go. If 
I take this out here, I'm not sure I like this effect here. Maybe I would go with something like a doubler effect or something like that. Just like a simple doubler effect. Just sounds a little too wacky to me here. Let me just load up my little favorite preset here. Welcome to Steal the Settings. So now with just these simple effects, and even if I don't use this, I don't think I like this either, you could hear how much depth and dimension and separation just opens up just from the raw original sound. And this didn't take very long to set up. It's just a simple thing. When you start to add on more tracks, of course, you have to consider all of the other elements that are in the mix. But you can kind of pull strategies together. If you're going to do something with the drums or with the kick drum, you're most likely going to do something similar with the other elements of the drum kit to kind of keep them in a common space or in some kind of common dimension within the 3D sound field in the mix. Same thing with the bass. And it's all about prioritizing instruments. If you really want to feature the lead vocal way out front, you can't start throwing everything way out front because then everything just collapses right back into the speakers. You have to make decisions about what you're prioritizing, what you want to pull forward, what needs more presence and brightness, what doesn't, and then make your mixing decisions accordingly. But it's all about creating contrast. It's all about creating depth and dimension and really understanding how to use the basic tools, right, so that frequency masking is not an issue. Just within the context of this, with that kind of separation, if I want more body out of the kick drum, no problem, I can do that, and it's not going to take away from the bass or create more conflict just between those two elements. Might a little bit, but way less than if everything is trying to stuck in this flat two-dimensional field, then you can't do anything and you feel really stuck and constricted. So the whole idea of this is that understanding that frequency masking is something that is more than just about frequencies. And when you start to understand that and think about it in the greater scheme of all the different levels of processing that you have to sort of create and shape sound, then you really start to understand how the whole mixing process works and how you really create professional mixes, getting the sounds that you want not just the sounds that will work. And that's like the whole, whole, like the whole nut of learning how to mix and doing things is like to make a mix that presents, you know, what you do really well or helps to present the artist in the best light so their song is as accessible and succeeds, right? So that's the, the whole goal here. So frequency masking. This is one of the many topics that's covered. And while I don't even really use this term, like you won't find this term on any of the things in the boot camp uh, where I go over this over the course of 52 weeks, but all the techniques I've shown you times a thousand <laughs> are in there, which show you all of the ways that you can use this dimension and how you build and strategize a whole mix, not just two elements in a mix. Because it's one thing to get that work, that two elements to work together like that when you start to put it in a larger structure of a mix then you know then you have to understand a little bit more of the interaction between different elements i cover that in in explicit detail really showing how you prioritize move things around and all of it is with audio examples i'm doing mixing demonstrations every week in this course so uh it's really amazing check it out uh it's a long, long, long course, 52 weeks, and uh, just loaded with multi-tracks and, and uh, lots of tips just like this. Um, and 
in with different styles of music, different mixes, so you'll see it done over and over again, and all of these ideas start to blend in and work together. So check it out at mixingwithmike.com. It's a boot camp tip, frequency masking.